Good afternoon. My name is Errol Francis and I'm the convener of today's session. And I want to wish a warm welcome to everyone who's joined. This is the final session in a series of online events entitled Museum Collections on Prescription, Health, Wellbeing and Inclusivity. The events are a collaboration between the Tate British Art Network and the National Gallery European Paintings Pre-1900 Network and the National Portrait Gallery Understanding British Portraits Professional Network. Before the COVID-19 pandemic took hold, the Consortium of Networks planned a conference entitled Museum Collections on Prescription, Political Rhetoric, Civic Responsibility or Engagement Opportunity. As the, of 20, as the events of 2020 unfolded, this was postponed and has been taking place as online events. Rather than focusing on the narrow question of social prescribing, there is now much more of an emphasis on working with collections to promote well-being, engaging diverse audiences, yet retaining the emphasis on the potential of museum collections as an aspect of civic responsibility. Each event has been programmed and chaired by a different person with different experiences and understandings of the overarching themes related to collections and well-being. And I'm delighted to have been asked to convene this last session, and I hope you will find the content stimulating and thought-provoking. This session has been convened around the theme of arts and culture for health, well-being and inclusivity or to put it another way, working with museum collections to tackle questions of identity in an intersectional sense in relation to gender, health status, racialization, sexuality, and social exclusion. I'm really excited to have secured the participation of an amazing panel of practitioners who each in their own way has approached questions of wellness in different modalities and, relation, and in relation to a variety of collections, not just art collections, but also including natural history, medicine and archives. I hope you caught the sound piece as you were waiting to join the webinar. It's entitled The Log Books podcast of untold stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history. And it was produced by writer Adam Smith with material from Switchboard's archive held at the Bishopsgate Institute, which contains records from London Gay Switchboard, a helpline for LGBTQ people established in 1974, now known as Switchboard LGBT plus helpline. The logbooks are an award-winning pod podcast featuring untold stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history and conversations about being queer today. If you didn't manage to catch the sound piece at, at the beginning, it will be repeated at the end of today's session. To ensure that you weren't met with strong language without any warning when you listened to the sound piece at the beginning of the session, Adam Smith very kindly created a special edited version for us that was played. This powerful audio work captures people's passion and strong feeling. And as such, there's an unedited version that contains strong language, which we thought some of you might like to hear in full. And this caption is also cap this version is also captioned. If you're likely to find this offensive or have children in the room, this will come at the very end of the session, and you may want to leave before that audio work is played. There'll be four presentations, and I'm pleased to have today live um, presentations from Professor Victoria Tischler, who is Associate Professor at the University of Exeter, Barbara Rodriguez Munoz, Curator at the Wellcome Collection, Miranda Lowe, who is Principal Curator and Museum Scientist at the Natural History Museum, and also Chair of Culture and, and Dr. Rob Barclay, MBE, founding editor of Blackout UK. You can read their full biographies and affiliations in the notes you have been sent for this webinar. Additionally, as a segue at the start of the break, I'm also pleased to be able to show you a slideshow entitled King George III, The Mind Behind the Myth, Amplifying the Voices 
of men with lived experience by artist Daniel Regan. The slideshow documents another dimension of working with collections in the work that Daniel did with men um, living with experiences of mental health, responding to objects belonging to King George III in the collection of historic royal palaces. Each of the speakers today will present what I believe is an expanded understanding of well-being, not as an instrumentalization of art as a form of political rhetoric, but as a deeper engagement around questions of illness and health. And at the end, we look very much look forward to your comments in the Q&A. And so now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Victoria Tischler, who is going to share her thoughts on the evidence supporting the different uses of collections for health and well-being. Over to Victoria. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here with you um, this afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to be <clears throat> speaking to you about my work with visual arts and older people, particularly working with older people who experience cognitive impairment or who live with dementia. And my work has been very much inspired by um, two particular uh, projects. Firstly, the Meet Me at MoMA um, project, um, which ran at the Museum of Modern Art in New York from 2007 to 2014, and provided a, a program for people with Alzheimer's disease and their family supporters to, to visit and experience the artwork. I was also inspired by the artwork of William Utemolin that you see here, uh, who was an artist who, after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, uh, documented um, in a series of self-portraits his physical and psychical decline uh, due to the condition. And I think uh, these artworks uh, speak volumes about the condition of dementia much more than words could represent. So some time ago, um, a colleague and I decided to expand the Meet Me at MoMA program and we established an intervention program at two art galleries, Nottingham Contemporary Gallery and Dulwich Picture Gallery, two very different gallery spaces. One, Nottingham Contemporary, opened in 2009 uh, with no permanent collection, um, showcasing temporary exhibitions of conceptual abstract art, often on uh, societal themes. And the second was D Dulwich Picture Gallery, which opened in a um, public gallery space, um, which has a permanent collection of 17th century art, much of it figurative. We designed an intervention for people living with dementia and their family supporters, which was identical um, in both gallery spaces, inviting them to come in and view the collection and make artwork in response. And here you see some images from those programs, uh, which included um, all participants um, curating artworks that were made by members of the group and also leading um, tours of the collections using a specially devised series of questions. Uh, and that included people living with dementia uh, using those questions to provide insights into the collection. Interestingly, we have found very similar results um, in terms of cognitive improvements um, and improved communication for participants in both gallery settings. And that's really inspired a, a rich and flourishing program of, of arts and public engagement research work, which I've continued um, to the current day. And just to mention the image that you see on the right showed some unanticipated use of technology by some of our older participants. And I think one of the things I learned from this very uh, formative piece of work for me was never to underestimate the capability of older people uh, and always to challenge in, in the kind of work that I do uh, with people, whatever their diagnosed condition may be. So now to some of the evidence for the use of arts um, and health. And just to mention that I'm going to be focusing on older people with dementia uh, in, in this brief talk. But what we know is that 
engaging with artwork, making artwork leads to cognitive stimulation in terms of improving, improving people's attention, enhancing people's mood. It improves communication. And importantly, that communication is meaningful communication, which means discussions about one's values, one's identity, uh, one's history, things that are meaningful to individuals rather than idle chit chat. We also know that people's speech becomes more fluent um, people hesitate less when they're engaged in a discussion about artwork or when they're making artwork. Visual arts provides a really important way of representing uh, our experiences. And this is particularly relevant when we're thinking about people living with dementia who may have problems with communication or may experience confusion or disorientation. So these type of um, visual communication modes can provide a bridge between someone with cognitive impairment uh, and their family supporters and care staff working with them. Often arts activities are done one on one or in a group and for people who experience social isolation, this can be a really important way of feeling included and of forming new positive social networks. We know that older people, even older people living with dementia are able to learn new artistic skills and grow in confidence and make choices about the types of activities they want to take part in. And the image you see on this slide, the slide is a really creative use of um, non-traditional artistic materials um, for this gentleman to express his creativity on paper. In addition to the research evidence, some of the things that I have noticed when engaging with artistic activity are that it can be particularly liberating for older people. In my work with people living with dementia, I've noted that with the onset of the condition, uh, there can sometimes be a disinhibition, which may be seen as a very negative thing in a health and social care setting. But this can actually be a very positive thing in terms of expressing one's creativity and provide an interesting space for people to express themselves in different ways. Engaging in creativity is also fun, and that's not a word that you hear used particularly often in health and social care settings. There's a sense of possibility in terms of um, the, the ambigu ambiguous quality of art and the possibilities of what one can create are almost limitless. It's also important that there's no right or wrong answer in terms of um, what people see, whether they create something that's figurative, something that's abstract. Within art, there can be lots of multiple ways in which these kind of materials and expressions can be comprehended. And that's extremely positive for some people who maybe experience a different reality to that that you or I may experience. It's important to challenge people as well, to provide them space to, to grow and to flourish no matter what age they are. In my early work, we were very much influenced by the work of Jean Cohen, who referred to phases in older life, including a liberation phase and a summing up phase, again, which provide this potential space for older people to, to grow and develop. And working with visual arts, as I have predominantly, can lead to the possibility of creation of art aesthetic outputs. So these artworks can be not just therapeutic for the individual, but the artworks can then be used in different ways to educate people about mental health conditions and to create a safe space for people to talk about things which may be incredibly distressing, such as the condition of dementia. Of course, it's also extremely empowering for the artists to have their work exhibited artistic training but people that come to creative activity um, but also have the possibility to create something which is really interesting um, and educative to the public uh, as well as empowering themselves as an individual in terms of having a sense of accomplishment for what they've achieved. So moving on now I wanted to tell you about some of the projects I'm involved with currently and the Culture Box project is a, an 18 month um, pandemic responsive project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council that um, our today's convener, Dr. Errol Francis is also involved in this project with me. We're working with 40 care homes across England to try and reach out to 
older people with dementia in care homes who've experienced severe deprivation uh, and, and, and um, disadvantage during the, the pandemic. Lots of the creative activities that have, would normally be provided have been ceased. So what we're doing with Culture Box is we're providing creative activities remotely. This includes by post and also digital activities which are co-designed with people living with dementia and, and care staff and a group of artists. We're especially trying to reach out to black and Asian communities um, who've experienced um, a particularly difficult time during the pandemic in terms of, of, of hardship and mortality. Um, so lots of the materials that we're creating are, we're trying to use a range of art forms, uh, a range of different artists so that we can reach a really diverse um, communities. And these artworks um, and creative activities are designed to be done uh, in partnership with a member of care staff. So they're designed to promote social interaction. Um, and there's a whole range of different activities to try and capture lots of different interests and lots of different art forms as well uh, for people to engage with. And we're collecting information about um, how, how well where uh, our materials are. interactions, uh, decreasing loneliness and providing creative stimulation during the pandemic. Uh, this still image that you see on this slide is a from an artistic commission um, that we have devised with uh, a choreographer called Akim to Saint Buck and this is a, uh, a dance piece that he has produced for Culture Box. Um, in response to the pandemic, which we used to introduce the project to our participants. I'm also an investigator on the Pandemic and Beyond project, which is a coordination project where we're looking to amplify the impact of more than 70 arts and humanities projects that have been funded to do research on the impact of creativity during the pandemic. Before I started working with older people, I have worked alongside artists for many years, um, co-designing, commissioning and curating um, different projects, all of which are about raising awareness of a range of mental health conditions. Um, the image you see at the top of the screen is from a collaboration with Farah Salah uh, called Brexit Means Brexit, which was about the psychological distress that some people experienced in response to the 2016 EU referendum result. Um, the sculptural image you see is a commission um, that I devised to commemorate the opening of the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham. It's called House for a Gordian Knot. And the artwork image with the bright orange background is by an artist called Mary Bishop, who was a, a patient in a psychiatric hospital and that was from an exhibition called Art in the Asylum which looked at the diagnostic and therapeutic use of art um, in mental health institutions and I think art creates a really accessible space for people to discuss uh, and um, contemplate and reflect on um, a whole range of issues which may be difficult um, to access a conversation about otherwise. I think for cultural institutions as well, um, using artwork in this way um, creates um, an opportunity to build new audiences and also to bring new people into the space. And also there's a real demand for socially engaged artists to work with people with mental health problems, to work alongside people with lived experience of mental health problems. Um, to, so I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there for artists to, to get involved. So I think there's a number of different ways that art, working with art can help individuals, can build the workforce and can also help cultural institutions um, diversify their audiences. And I wanted to finish by mentioning a couple of public engagement projects where I've worked with collections of artwork. Um, one was the Imagination Cafe, which was a pop-up 
art installation which toured uh, different venues in the UK, including Moston in North Wales and City Art Centre in Scotland. Um, and the idea was that the inspiration was artwork that was created by people living with dementia. And this artwork was not made to be exhibited. It was artifacts from a research project called Dementia and Imagination. But the artwork to me was of sufficient quality and aesthetic interest that we devised this installation around it and invited people with dementia and, and their families to come to the installation, which was an operational cafe. Um, as you can see, the, the atmosphere was, was very festive. And what was interesting about this installation was that although it was created for people with dementia, in fact, a broad cross-section of the public came in. So it provided a very engaging, immersive and accessible space for people to come and find out more about dementia and also to challenge some of the negative stereotypes uh, that people may have about to people living with dementia and some of the stigma um, addressing some of this experience by people living with the condition. This format has been incredibly successful and I've replicated it in lots of different settings outside of the cultural sector, for example, working with a rugby club and their archive collection to bring older men uh, who are living with dementia and men who experience social isolation in the community to come in and explore archival collections and also to enjoy um, a social experience um, in, a, in a fun, immersive space. And the other project is in collaboration with Paintings in Hospitals where we used um, artworks from their collection in conversation with artworks made by people living with dementia. And these artworks were chosen and curated by students and care staff and university staff um, to create a space where people could come together to talk about dementia and to talk about some of the creative ways in which people um, can respond um, to the condition and to engage people living with the condition in lots of positive ways. So building on the research evidence, but also increasing awareness of, of the condition of dementia. So I just wanted to summarize by saying, I, I hope this has given you an insight into some of the different ways in which art can be used by individuals and by galleries and cultural institutions and by artists in a way to create a therapeutic potential for individuals, but also to um, bring new audiences into, into galleries and institutions. Thank you for your attention. Hi everybody and thank you to Errol and the network networks for inviting me here. I'm really honored to share the screen um, with you and all the wonderful panelists. I'm also becoming increasingly excited by the reopening of Welcome Collection and other museums um, later on in May. And after this pause of sorts, I'm expecting to see more evolved and robust responses and strategies to center health, well-being and inclusivity across the sector. So it's really good timing for, for this event and for us uh, coming here together today. Um, so I work as a curator at Welcome Collection and over the last couple of years I've also been guest editing the Documents of Contemporary Art Anthology on Health, which is um, co-published by the Whitechapel Gallery and the MIT Press. So I've been working with collections, with artists, with thinkers, audiences on health and care, problematizing them and expanding them. Um, so from projects uh, that deal with chronic illness and healing to the climate breakdown and ecology while exposing the colonial and patriarchal narratives um, that are kind of embodied by our collections, our medical collections. So this for me means challenging notions of normality, so this idea of healthy productive bodies and engaging with the politics of health and care. So how it intersects with gender, with coloniality, with racialization, with climate, clim climate justice and so on. And both as an editor and as a curator, I try to create safer spaces um, where vulnerability can be exposed, where kind of private narratives and the public collapse. And so I think about how um, 
I was talking about the private and the public collapse, and I think about how I can support the artists that we collaborate and our visitors in this encounter. So I'm going to introduce a couple of exhibitions I've co-curated at um, Welcome, which Errol visited, and, and I think Victoria too, if I can remember. Um, and Errol thought that they were a good kind of case study for this uh, conversation. So we were both discussing that I could focus on artistic and curatorial methodologies that expose the trauma and violence in the collections to open up for the possibility of psychological restitution um, of healing. We were also discussing what we mean when we say health or wellness and how these terms are deeply ingrained in a neoliberal logic of productivity and consumerism. So wellness as a destination, health as a destination, when the reality is that recovery and health that are never complete and injuries may need to remain visible. Exposed, which can be triggering. Uh, so for this is vital that museums can create safer, open and inclusive. So with this in mind, the two projects are Ayurvedic Man, which I co-curated with Sita Reddy, um, and it's a display, or it was a display of our South Asian collection, um, artworks and manuscripts um, focusing on healing, and misbehaving bodies, which I co-curated with George Vasi. Uh, and it was conceived as a dialogue between the practices of Joe Spence and Orit Ashery, focusing on the representation of chronic illness, death and dying. Uh, so Ayurvedic Man, and on the slide you can see um, the title, Ayurvedic Man, Encounters with Indian Medicine over a Yellow Background. Um, so at Welcome we have an interdisciplinary transhistorical approach of working with contemporary artists and researchers um, and audiences and communities, which is really anchored in our collections. The collections are very rich, but also deeply problematic. They were gathered by a network of collectors following colonial roots, and following Henry Wellcome's instructions to capture the art and science of healing through the ages. So following a series of um, activities organized by the Wellcome Trust in 2015 in India under the title Medicine Corner, which were exploring plurality in Indian medicine using our collection, I was asked to develop a version of this project for London for Wellcome Collection. Um, and it was a very, very uncomfortable starting point. So this is a Western institution doing a show on Indian medicine with material from South Asia held at Welcome in London. I'm not an expert on these fields. My background is contemporary art and exhibition making. And I really wanted to avoid a blockbuster, comprehensive or uncritical display of our collection, which I felt could have been expected um, by many. Uh, and this is only five years ago. So for us, the answer was to focus on our collection, uh, our historical collections from South Asia, and to frame them as part of a colonial project, while being transparent about where they came from, who purchased them and why, and really engaging with the more complex narratives of rupture, exploitation, and representation gaps that arise in collections built from colonial encounters. We invited Sita Reddy as a curatorial advisor She's, she's wonderful, she's a medical sociologist, expert in the history of Ayurveda and yoga, and was a fellow at the Welcome Library at the time. We both share a desire to reclaim the collection of objects from objects of trauma, embodying patriarchal, corporate and colonial forces to objects of healing. Um, so in a moment of kind of slight desperation, trying to find a historical anchor for the provenance of the collection, and all the museum researchers and curators that are here today and who are listening know that this is really not straightforward. Uh, my brilliant colleagues, Ross Mark uh, Farman, Mark Farlane and Ruth Horry, who are experts, real experts in the history of our collection, introduce us to a set of uncatalogued boxes of correspondence between collector, Dr. Paramal, and Welcome's curator at the time, Thompson. So here on the slide, you can see one of these letters with um, the material that was collected by Dr. Paramal and how much um, he paid for it and, and the quantity. So Paramal, um, you can see a portrait of Dr. Paramal uh, on the slide um, on the right, was a um, doctor born in India and trained in Europe. He was also an expert on Asian cultures and in 1911 he was sent to India to source material for Henry Wellcome's Historical Medical Museum in London. And then there was one paragraph 
in these boxes of correspondence that when I read it, I really felt that it unlocked the narrative for the show. And so it was written in 1917 from Thompson to Paramal and it said, I am asked by them, so the Welcome Chemical Research Laboratories, to point out for our future guidance when similar plants come under your notice with some local reputation that you should obtain. The native name, the botanical name if possible, indicating the locality in which the plant grows and if it's obtainable in quantity. So these words reveal that Mal was not just instructed to collect artworks and manuscripts and artifacts for the museum, but also to acquire traditional knowledge by bringing medicinal plants to the Welcome Research Laboratories and copying and translating Sanskrit, Persian and Buddhist manuscripts. It was a commercial enterprise and it was tainted with an orientalist gaze. And here on the slide, you can see a beautiful drawing of um, curcuma or turmeric, uh, which is well known for its um, anti-inflammatory properties. So we place these letters as captions, as context for the objects, for the collection, removing the curatorial voice. Um, the letters are insightful. They are very uncomfortable to read as the language has often the paternalistic and imperialist tone that reveals the power structures at the time. And many of them are still at play today in science and in culture. We also wanted to address how the narratives of healing and their associated cultural expressions, so like the object that we were presenting in the show, have been expanded, contaminated, misinterpreted and exoticized through encounters with different cultural contexts. So in the case of the painting that, they gave, that gave the title to the exhibition, the Ayurvedic Man, which is one of the gems in our collection, um, and you can see it in the slide uh, under this kind of white, inside this kind of white cocoon, um, so yeah, the Ayurvedic man is an 18th century painting depicting the organs and vessels of the male body according to classical Ayurveda. It was made in Nepal, but the Sanskrit verses that surround the image come from a 16th century Ayurvedic compendium from the north of India. It came from Nepal via India to welcome library through an art dealer. So this is a trail of provenance that adds to the multiple cultural encounters that had already shaped it. We were also keen to exp um, expose the gaps in our collection. So a great deal of the reports and documentation that we have uh, deal with the public health strand of the British colonial administration in India. And those mainly represent the colonial perspective, like this image from Captain C. Moss Bombay Plague album. And the collection leaves a void when it comes to local perspectives. To address this, we partnered with Gasworks, a residency space in London, and invited Mumbai-based artist Ranjit Kandalgaonkar to come to London and engage critically with the archives. He has spent uh, six months in London researching, drawing, and he's very missed by me and, and many other people in the teams. And the result of his research was this gorgeous, long, intricate drawing uh, titled Drawing the Bombay Plague. And the drawing reimagined the events that took place during the plague outbreak of 1896 in India, depicting the violent and unpopular measures imposed by the British colonial administration, which is what is really represented in our collections, sanitation, quarantine, hospitalization, all too familiar uh, for all of us these days, um, and a range of local responses from the magazine, uh, the, the Indian magazine Hindu Punch. So he was bringing together the colonial and the local imagination in this drawing. And the images that, that, that we see and that he drew uncannily and tragically remind us of what we are seeing in media around the globe right now. And this really highlights how important it is for museums to address their gaps in knowledge and representation. Um, there was an interactive version of the drawing which was developed by Hato. Uh, um, a team of designers based in London, where visitors could have access to the library collection, so both our collection, but also the Hindu Punch, and they kind of zoom, they can they could kind of zoom into the images using these touch sensitive projectors, which is really really an amazing technology to open up collections that I hope we can use again in the future when touching is is, is allowed. Um, but the collection also has gaps in in one's knowledge and. Um, so when it comes to anatomical maps, such of those 
chart in chakras and metaphysical energies, the male form is the norm. Unless it deals with birth, we only see male bodies. So we aim to point at these voids, to highlight them, and this really means letting go. Letting go the narrative of the soul, which can present a risk to engage audiences as they experience the narrative of the exhibition being fractured. Um, but perhaps this experience is important, and as a public institution, we need to be able to, to hold the discomfort. And the exhibition ended with, I think, my favorite show here on the, um, my, my left. It's an illustrated manuscript depicting Jane cosmology, uh, and it sets light on the interconnectivity between human and non-human species and their relation to the cosmos, highlighting the connections between our environment and our health. So to reclaim these artworks as objects of file, violence and, and healing, so objects that can hold both truths, means to go beyond superficial readings of them as an aesthetic practice, which is easy to do because they are gorgeous, and instead expose the historical context of colonization in which these items were acquired, studied and displayed. To reveal the different cultural layers that have shaped their narratives of healing, so in this case, Tibetan, Jain, Buddhist, Persian and also European, and to openly and politically acknowledge the voids in medical collections when it comes to non-Western and women's health and knowledges. It means to engage with the violence and discomfort that they embody and grant them with a layer discursive space to build other interpretations onto the existing set of references, perhaps a process of remediation, but it also involves us integrating the more expansive cultural anthologies of health that these artworks tell us to reconceptualize our body as interconnected with all beings. And I will now introduce a bit more briefly misbehaving bodies, which you can see um, on the slide. Uh, and I co-curated this exhibition with George Vasse. Um, it was conceived as a dialogue between artist Joe Spence and Audit Ashery. Their practice foregrounds health diversity by bringing together critical approaches to the representation of illness and dying not as a taboo subject, but as part of the creative texture of life. This dialogue was amplified with the voices and experiences of care workers, patients and academics that we incorporated in the making of the exhibition and the life program. The starting point for the exhibition was the acquisition by um, our colleagues in the collections and research team of uh, a few prints by photographer Joe Spence. Um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with her work. I think that both the uh, Tate and National Portrait Gallery um, um, have some of her works in the collection. She was a British photographer, writer and cultural worker. She began her career in the field of commercial photography and documentary, but soon turned the camera towards herself and used her life experience of illness to challenge conventional representations of perfect lives. For the show, we focus on her works documenting her family traumas, her breast cancer diagnosis, and her health regime through the 80s. We invited Oritasari to present new works that could dialogue with Joe Spencer's works, as well as to co-curate the life program taking place in the gallery space where we want to create a sense of community. Orit is a London-based inter interdisciplinary artist, and she's also an associate professor at the Ruskin and her work looks at different types of marginalization and creates safer spaces for intersectional communities coming together. We presented Revisiting Genesis, which is a mini series of 12 films uh, that merge fact and fiction to explore the legacies of artists living with life limiting conditions. Um, the work takes an absurd and critical approach to emergent technologies surrounding death and dying. So, for example, companies that will manage your Facebook account when you are not here, or avatars that are created for our loved ones to mourn us. Um, so it really touches on the pressures to maintain a public digital presence, um, even after our lives. So in a way, a read really activates and updates the ideas and methodologies that the works in our collection, that the works of Joe Spence um, uh, did, um, and the way that Joe Spence was experimenting with representation of vulnerability and problematizing health. Alongside Revisiting Genesis, we commissioned Arita Seri to create a new film, um, and she created a very moving um, work 
about the recent death of her father in Jerusalem and her process of mourning. We also invited her to co-curate the life program and shape the design of the space. And because we're thinking about well-being, I wanted to describe a bit um, the space design. Um, it was a collaboration between Welcome Collection, David Con Architects, Mark El Katif as the graphic designer, and Orit, with consultation from patients and carers from Maggie's charity. We wanted to create this kind of more community space, feeling in a museum, which is really hard. <laughs> That's not how museums feel. Um, but we wanted the space to be warm, playful, supportive, for our visitors, the subject matter was heavy, but there is a strong sense of humor in both Joe Spence and Orit Asheri's work, and we want to honor this. So you can see these teddy bears that um, act as sitting spaces, and also how we presented the films in these cocoons, pink cocoons uh, made with tie-dye fabric, which was designed by Orit. Um, and I think, um, sorry, I think for the first time, I witnessed people napping in, in the museum during the summer. They were just kind of fast asleep there, taking ownership of the space, which was, um, it was really good to see. There was also a central table with chairs that was installed, contextualizing reading materials. Um, but the table also hosted discussions with um, groups, communities, artists, residences, and workshops. And this was co-curated by Orit um, with Persilia Canton and was crucial for access and participation and to activate the collection. And on this table, um, Orit Asheri placed this question for our visitors, do you consider yourself healthy? And there was a plastic box which was filled up and empty uh, with responses from our public. And those responses were read live by actors and performers on a number of occasions during the duration of the exhibition throughout the Welcome Collection building. The archive continues to grow and engaging visitors in the reading room from the 18th of May when we reopen our doors. And now that we are, you know, this is pre-pandemic, uh, the first part of the project, so I'm, I'm really curious to see how the responses have shifted um, in the current um, crisis. So this is my light slide. Um, so yeah, uh, Errol and I started questioning what we mean with um, wellness, with being healthy, how it's never complete, not a destination, how injuries may need to remain visible, and how exposing this reality with care can make a museum space safer and, and more inclusive. So here is what being healthy really means um, for our visitors. Um, and I just wanna end by saying that I'm, I'm really drawn to Spence and Asheri's narratives because they serve a refusal to describe a journey to recovery as an individual story of, of survival their work alongside many other artists and writers exposing illness, exposing how the personal is political, like Adre Lord, like Anne Boyer, or artist Caroline Laser or Johanna Hevda, ha really inspired this exhibition and also the anthology on health. Um, they argue that the vulnerability of our bodies and the traumas that we carry reveal structural aspects of our societies which I think are in turn embodied by our cultural institutions. And there is still a blind spot within diversity agendas in cultural programs where health intersectionality is um, still neither articulated or nurtured. And I think that artists as usual are leading on these changes. They are taking the burden and doing the hard work for us. For example, Reed or Spence did in the 80s and 90s. And they are producing work that critically engaged with health and they're writing and enforcing um, access and inclusion guidelines. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel Regan, a photographic artist and artistic director in the arts and health sector. I work freelance on commissions and participatory projects primarily relating to mental health. I'm also the director of the Arts and Health Hub, a not-for-profit organisation that supports artists working in the sector. And I'm the artistic director of the Free Space Project, an arts and health charity based in primary care in the NHS in North London. In this presentation, I'll be sharing a project that I worked on just prior to the pandemic. In 2019, I was commissioned by Historic Royal Palaces to work on the community aspect of their upcoming exhibition at Kew Palace. The exhibition, titled George III, The Mind Behind the Myth, is an exploration of the life of King George III, 
with 2020 marking the bicentenary of his death. In popular culture, George is often referred to as the Mad King due to his documented mental health difficulties. This exhibition aims to look at George as a whole person, looking beyond simply his mental health difficulties, but his contribution to arts and science and much more. On show are a number of objects belonging to George and relating to his life, from his clothes to musical instruments and letters from his doctors. Working in partnership with local organisations such as Mind in Richmond, men with lived experience of mental health difficulties were invited to a taster day at the palace to find out about the project before signing up. The aim of the project was to work in collaboration with men with lived experience to explore both historical and contemporary understandings of mental health. Across the project, around 8 to 10 men took part over a number of months. The focus of the outcomes for Q Palace were on the men providing their own curatorial labels to go on show next to the objects shown in the exhibition. This was something I had not necessarily come across before, and it piqued my interest as a facilitator. Elevating the voices of people with lived experience in a non-exploitative way is at the essence of my own work. As a starting point, I shared some of my own photographic images with the men, exploring abandoned mental asylums after my own psychiatric hospitalisation at age 19. In sharing my own lived experience, it meant that others were able to open up about their mental health experiences too. The men were clearly told about the aims and objectives of the project, and that sessions would involve creative writing, reflective conversation, trips to heritage sites, and of course, lots of free lunches. Many of the men, myself included, are not regular visitors to heritage sites. The majority of sessions took place at the palace in the grounds of Kew Gardens, and taking place in the summer, this made for a fantastic site for creativity, with the men having access to the grounds after sessions, free of charge to roam and explore. A place that can seem designed for others suddenly felt like it was theirs too, because of the invitation to such a unique experience. In the early sessions, the men had fantastic introductions to curators working on the project, with the opportunity to ask in-depth questions about the history of the palace and George's life. They were given private tours of the palace and access to the catalogue of objects that would be going on show in the exhibition. The men began their creative journeys by trying out a number of creative writing activities. For some, this was brand new and a little nerve-wracking, so myself and the community producer supported them in any way that we could. And through poetry, prose and other forms of writing, they tried to deeply connect with George's life and experiences, and their own experiences too. In one session, we asked them to bring in a personal object that they felt deeply connected to. And in the session, we shared reflections on our lives as men, how different mental health attitudes are, and what these objects have meant to us over time. Punctuated throughout the project were trips to other sites too. On one occasion, HRP arranged transport for everyone to go to Windsor Castle. On this trip, the men were invited behind the scenes by one of the exhibition curators. In the library, the librarians brought out a number of personal objects, artworks and letters relating to George's life. On another occasion, the men visited Hampton Court. We were treated to conversations with archivists and conservationists that made the trip feel special. The men were able to see some of George's clothing and they had the time and freedom to ask questions. It felt like a special trip to be a part of, with the men's contributions to the exhibition being recognised by these generous trips and visits. Alongside these trips, the men also visited the Royal College of Physicians to see letters written to George by his doctors about his health. Whilst the outcome for the exhibition focuses on the curatorial labels, the men made far more work than that over the course of the project. And prior to our last session, I designed a book of all of their creative writing mixed in with my own photographs. In that final session, I led them on a bookbinding workshop where they hand-bound their own books that each participant got to keep. The clear value of this project has been in the valuing of the time and experiences of the men who so generously devoted their time to the project. They were treated with dignity, respect and prestige. Their opinions and thoughts were encouraged. And their contribution to the exhibition, opening in June 2021, challenges the power of the curatorial voice offering the opportunity for the everyday man to contribute their own thoughts on heritage and mental health. Welcome back, everybody. And I want to thank uh, Victoria and Barbara for such wonderful uh, presentations, and I hope you found them interesting and inspirational. And I um, also hope you enjoyed uh, Daniel's uh, slide show uh, at the beginning of the break. 
Uh, there is a question about that, but if I may leave that until the uh, Q&A starts so that we can go on with the uh, presentations. And uh, so it's a, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Miranda Lowe, who is uh, Principal Curator at the Natural History Museum. And she's going to talk about the well-being potential of natural history collections. Thank you. Thanks, Hale, and uh, welcome everyone. So, uh, what does the what is the well-being potential um, of or behind natural history collections? So, this is uh, this um, uh, painting. This is what um, kind of summarizes my, my talk in terms of health and well-being and inclusivity in terms of natural history collections. Um, hopefully in the last year, most of us have been able to have some sort of access to um, green spaces, parks and gardens. Um, and that has been for me personally, tremendous um, to be able to at least have that to get outside and enjoy the natural world as well as it's part of my role at the museum. Um, this painting is by an artist called Jean-Baptiste de Brett, um, a French artist um, who went to Brazil and from around 1834 to 1839 was actually documenting um, the, the life and the culture of um, the indigenous people of Brazil. And here you can see that there have been people out on a collecting trip. And so that links to a bit of my, my scientific world, um, doing collecting of plants and animals. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot. And they, do they say that a picture can um, speak for a thousand words? So there's a lot going on here. And I'm gonna delve into um, certain aspects of what natural history paintings and illustrations um, can, can tell us by looking at them and what is often not told behind the scenes, you know, what these people were doing, who these people are and how they're documented within our collections in terms of collecting and how the things that they were collected were beneficial to us um, in our everyday world in terms of, of, of um, medication, medicines, and as I said, um, accessing green spaces. So what you can see here um, is looking up into the space known as the Hinsey Hall at the Natural History Museum in South Kensington, in London in the UK. And this was known since around about 2005 as the um, Gilded Canopy because there was a book um, related to this. And looking, when you stand in the main hall, the Hinsey Hall of the Natural History Museum, and you look up, you see this image here, and it is of 100, around 162 botanical um, illustrations of, of plants, um, which illustrate, uh, which actually illustrate the trade and, and the British Empire at that time. So the museum was actually open, Natural History Museum was opened in 1881. And often you can miss this in the rush to actually go and see the exhibitions at the museum. Um, but this um, gleaming canopy, you know, the paintings are set against wood, there's glass and there's metal, fashioning a roof that complements the splendor of the specimens that are actually in um, uh, below in the bays of the hall, but also there are a lot of stories, um, medicinal and otherwise, that are hidden behind each panel. And a couple of years ago, there was one panel in particular that, uh, where a story resonated for me that I wanted to reveal. And to make sure that more people knew and acknowledged what this plant, what health benefit it was, and who, who was the person who was credited in terms of discovering the medicinal properties of this plant. So this is a close up of the Hintzy Hall ceiling panel. So this plant here is called Quasia Amara. And this person here, Carl Linnaeus, is actually um, recognized for the, what well, they call him the, the godfather of taxonomy 
So he was a Swedish botanist essentially, and um, he collected plants or plants were sent to him around the mid 1700s. Um, there's actually a historical society named after him called the Linnaean Society. Um, but Carl Linnaeus actually named this plant, Quasia amara, after, let's go here, um, after this person, and he's called Graman Quasi. So Graman Quasi was a Surinese healer, botanist, an enslaved person, but then later got his freedom of the 18th century, who is best today known for having his name given to the plant species of Quasia. The picture shows the celebrated Brahman Quasi in his gold lace coat, a feathered hat, a gold medal, and a gold cane. As a child, Quasia was enslaved and brought to the New World as an enslaved person to Suriname, a Dutch colony in South America. He participated in wars against the Surimaca Maroons. I hope I got that pronunciation, so forgive me if it wasn't quite right as a scout and a negotiator for the Dutch. And he lost his right ear during the fighting. So he's quite controversial in that sense. Um, for this reason, the Suriname, the Surinese Maroons remember him as a traitor. But in this context, I'm remembering him also um, as a discoverer of this plant. So Quasi worked as a healer of some renown and fared so well that he was able to accumulate enough money to buy his freedom. In 1730, he had discovered the medicinal properties of Quasia Amara. One of his remedies was a bitter tea that he used to treat infections by intestinal parasites and served for the next 60 decades as the colony's leading medicine man with vast influence over all the inhabitants, black, white, and native of Suriname. For Gourmand Quasi, it was the success in the field of botany and medicine in which Carl Linnaeus honored him for using the, the bark of the Quasia tree in Suriname to, to cure fever. A discovery that has enabled sci many scientists to use Quasia in medicines like bitter tonic, and, and Fermajuge. Quasia's secret medicinal formula was purchased for a considerable sum by a student called Daniel Rolinder, one of Linnaeus's students, who then took the bark back with him to Europe around 1756. A specimen of the tree, which was from which which the remedy comes from, was presented by Carl Gustaberg a Swedish plantation owner in Suriname to Linnaeus in 1761. And from then, Carl Linnaeus immediately described the plant. And, and so as a botanist, that's what Carl Linnaeus would do. He would describe new species of plants all the time. And he was able to, um, well, the recipe from um, Graman Quasi was purchased and brought back to Europe, but also the samples of the plant which Carl Linnaeus in his description then would publish. And this is how it went out to the wider scientific community and entered into the world of pharmacopoeia or pharmacology. So in by telling this story, it's actually recognizing that there was a, a black person who actually discovered this and then was able to, with his knowledge, to transfer his knowledge to a European who then took it out um, into um, the pharmaceutical industry. Quasia continues to be used industrially, producing medicines against intestinal parasites today. And in contemporary accounts, um, Quasia is, is known as, and often described as one of the most extraordinary black men in Suriname and perhaps the world at that time. And later on in his life, Quasi became, Quasi became a planter himself and remained active well into his 90s. And in telling this story, it gets people to actually look when they come into the museum, not only look up, but also to investigate 
what other hidden histories and stories that, that um, impact on our lives that you know, help us remain healthy, um, are used in many of the medicinal products that we use today. And the Gilded Canopy has much more and many more stories like that to actually reveal. So here's another example, and this is part of John Reed's um, collection. Most people might know John Reed's in terms of botanical illustrations. So um, the collection of illustrations related to him are actually housed in our special collections library at the Natural History Museum, but also um, at the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society. But what I'm showing you here is an uh, illustration from his collection concerning a horseshoe crab. Now, it doesn't look anything, the animal image doesn't look anything like a crab, that's just its common name. But this animal is more closely related to scorpions. Um, so it's not actually a, a crab at all. And the reason why I'm showing you this illustration, um, again, kind of delving into the, um, the taxonomy, so that's like the naming and the properties um, of this particular animal, where it's really important to human lives and health and well-being. In 1967, a chap called um, Dr. Frederick Bang, he actually discovered that the uh, medicinal properties within the blood of this animal were beneficial to human beings. So the horseshoe crab has what we like Lucy call is blue blood. It's kind of slightly translucent with a little bit of a blue tinge to it. And um, it discovered that, um, so you can see there's a dissected um, part of, of this illustration, which is the tail of the animal. And um, at that point in time, he discovered, Frederick Bang discovered that if you pin the tail back and you actually bleed these animals, you get this blue blood out. And there, there is a particular um, chemical within that blood that can be used to um, test for endotoxins, to test for drug purity. So to make sure that any tablets that we have that goes out through the pharmaceutical industry, that it is pure and it's not um, detrimental to our own health or, or not causing any additional de detriment to our own health. Um, the other um, two qualities that this uh, blood of the horseshoe crab have, it can be used to um, for quick testing for meningitis, but also for um, a particular eye disease called retin retinoid pigmentosa. Now, um, these animals were once um, sort of farmed, um, taken from the wild and farmed and, and bled um, for those properties in their blood. Now, it's done, um, well, they're protected species. You, they only, you only find them in four areas within the world. And um, they are, well, actually the properties of their blood are actually being developed more synthetically. I've got Hans Sloan here. And Hans Sloan is um, in terms of the British Museum and the Natural History Museum, um, his collections are the founding collections. And the reason why I'm showing you this image here of Hans Sloan on the left, but also of cocoa or the cocoa bean on the right. And he is famously known for um, popularizing um, the, the drinking chocolate, actually by adding sugar and milk and popularizing that. But he was a physician um, in the 1700s in um, Jamaica. He collected over 800 um, plant species and some animals, but he did use enslaved African labor within Jamaica to collect those plants and animals. And um, while he was there, he, he documented a lot of observations of those Africans actually using um, the cocoa bean to create um, a medicinal drink. Um, and because um, he's quoted as saying that it was very bitter and nauseous and he wouldn't actually get, give it to anybody that was stu um, suffering from stomach problems, that the addition of warming it and, and perhaps also adding the cocoa to other, to sweeten other medicines that would be more beneficial um, to, to us or anybody that was suffering from any um, stomach ailments. 
This is a fantastic website that I found recently, and so I urge you all to go and have a look at it. But this is again um, another um, representation of more information on the cocoa bean using Mark Kate's bees or Kate's bees um, illustrations here on the right, um, because the cocoa was is not um, native to the Caribbean. Um, it's from South America, but due to enslavement, and that's what happened with a, a lot of, lot of plants um, transferred from one country to, to another. And um, just before I end my talk, so um, some of the examples that I've given you here today of how um, natural history and natural history collections are um, important in terms of our own health and well-being, and delving a bit deeper in terms of acknowledgement and inclusivity in terms of the, the knowledge um, and the transfer of knowledge and the narratives within. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I developed a tour on some of the examples that I've given you today. And this is just a, tw um, a tweet that a school teacher who came on my very first Black History Tour at the museum put out there. So there is um, a call and it's great that people are enthusiastic to actually learn um, more and listen to more and engage with these stories and a way of being more inclusive within the museum space. And if you want to read more um, about my work, so um, I think it would be in some of the links that were sent out to you. So this is just a, um, a copy of my paper that tells those stories and a lot more. And I'll just leave you with this beautiful, I'm um, hopefully very calming, inspiring, image of um, some uh, walkers for a group called Wild in the City that um, I, I go and, and do walking with. And again, um, that group is um, for um, people of colour to engage with nature and to feel the confidence um, in terms of, of walking within the countryside and, and in terms of access for their own health and wellbeing. So thank you for listening. So it's with a uh, uh, great pleasure uh, I just want to share with you some thoughts about uh, about Blackouts, uh, the organisation that I work with, um, and the use of the arts. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, represent it uh, through looking at um, through looking uh, at a an example. Um, and starting with uh, a, an exhibition um, that I never saw. Um, but maybe uh, there are reasons why. So in 1992, uh, Glenn Ligon produced uh, uh, an exhibition called Good Mirrors Are Not Cheap uh, that depended on uh, a series of quotes. Um, Good Mirrors Are Not Cheap is a quote from uh, Audrey Lord, uh, and 1992 is a really important year for me. 1992 was a year in which uh, I um, started at university um, and uh, came to terms with my sexuality and started to tell people uh, that I'm a gay man. So there I am, uh, slightly later in 1993 with my parents. Um, at university um, and feeling completely isolated, feeling like I was the first black gay man ever. And I think people do feel uh, uh, during that particular kind of maelstrom of, uh, of, of hormones and uh, coming to terms with your difference. Um, people often feel like, like they're the first, that they're the pioneer looking around for uh, for examples, people that they can look up to, that they can follow. Um, and I really struggled uh, back then to find uh, anything about the, the Black queer experience in the UK. Um, and I genuinely was concerned that um, launching out into a, into a, a career, um, aiming for... Uh, uh, for success in British society, uh, there was no roadmap that I was uh, going to be doing this uh, all alone. So rather than, uh, uh, 
don't, don't face all of that alone. It becomes an incredibly important way to think about the way in which we use uh, the arts, um, the arts generally, to, uh, to reflect, to be that good mirror uh, back, to, uh, back to the population, back to people that we're seeking uh, to serve. And I, I mentioned that uh, because the first gay uh, institution that I went to uh, was a nightclub, uh, understandably. Did the classic walk around the block two or three times. I uh, then attached myself to the end of the queue feeling really self-conscious and incredibly vulnerable and visible. Um, I got to the front of the queue and I was asked by the bouncer uh, do you know what? Do you know what kind of club this is? Well, it does say GAY above the door, so uh, I, I had a pretty good idea. Um, he then proceeded to ask me, "So, uh, are you gay or what?" Um, and what an existential question to ask a, 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 a nineteen-year-old in a in a queue for for a nightclub. Um, and then he asked me to prove it. Uh, his excuse being, we get a lot of your, a lot of people in here who are just here to deal drugs. So that's my welcome to, uh, to my uh, homosexual life. Um, and said a lot about uh, my visibility and my vulnerability uh, as soon as I reveal that, uh, um, my sexuality. Um, and I should really have guessed, right? When, uh, when G-A-Y was translated as good as you, I should have realized that really this wasn't uh, for me. Uh, I was very conscious of my, di my difference um, and was seeking to access a, a, a conversation, uh, certainly a, uh, an understanding uh, of the world, or a way of making meaning in the world that understood that experience of marginalization, that experience of invisibility. Um, so I was looking uh, for a good mirror. Um, and in the process of, fi of finding the mirror that I can trust, uh, I was exposing myself to a set of vulnerabilities um, and to what felt like a relentless uh, uh, scrutiny uh, from the rest of the world. Um, I needed a space in which I could explore uh, what it meant to be a black queer man now. Um, I, I refer to uh, the white gaze uh, in the title. Um, because it is an important, uh, an important statement about, uh, about positionality and perspective uh, and the importance of understanding that in sociology. But really as, as a bit of an in-joke, because uh, between 92 and, uh, and, and 94, um, those kind of years of emerging onto a, onto a gay scene, um, I looked around for evidence of black queer existence uh, without much luck. Um, until I came across uh, this book, uh, Welcome to the Jungle uh, by Cobbin and Mercer. Um, and it's, it's to be praised for, uh, for a myriad of things. But firstly, uh, proving that you can study Michael Jackson uh, for a living. I thought it was an amazing, uh, <laughs> an amazing bit of insight. But just in the uh, acknowledgements, there's a little throwaway line. I would also like to thank everyone involved in the gay black group in early 80s London. And in those 12 words um, was uh, the hook that got me through the uh, uh, institution where I felt particularly isolated and started my journey of activism to find, uh, like Coppin had found uh, previously, to my tribe, to find that group of people uh, that, um, that could 
help make meaning uh, together because actually um, the, the attempts that I had been making uh, to make sense of the world as an individual and, and solely as a um, uh, without community uh, weren't leading to outcomes which I um, uh, which uh, of which I could be proud um, and in Glenn Ligon's uh, exhibition that I didn't know about um, and that toured uh, from New York and came across in 93, I think, uh, to the Barbican. And I still didn't know. Um, Glenn Ligon uh, has man manages in his, uh, uh, in his notes to set out uh, a series of quotes which seek to disrupt notions of monolithic blackness. Um, the exact conversation that I needed uh, to hear when I was 18 and 19. Um, as Greg, uh, Greg Tate is quoted in the, uh, in the book that says, perhaps it's a supreme irony uh, of a black existence is how broadly black people debate the question of cultural identity among themselves while getting branded as a cultural monolith by those who would deny us the complexity and complexion of a community, let alone a nation. Um, so I was seeking uh, the texture, the complexity of my, uh, of my experience and finding it nowhere. Um, and that tied really, um, really importantly for me uh, to, uh, to my sense of self, my sense of belonging, but also the sense of how we were going to uh, come together to build the tools, um, come together to create a community uh, that was not uh, exclusive, uh, but one which uh, started a journey of inclusion uh, for black queer men. Um, and I, it's always worth uh, reminding ourselves when we start about the, um, about the challenge about, the, about the, the, the gap between uh, the professional language of curation, the professional language of art, um, and the temptation to, uh, to, to, to only address um, the arts in, a, uh, uh, in an intellectual manner, um, because that's safer, um, rather than uh, understanding um, that this is more than uh, 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 an aesthetic, more than uh, a nice to have, um, but fundamental uh, in terms of people shaping uh, their sense of existence and their connections with each other. Um, as Audre Lorde says, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. For the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house they will never allow us to bring about genuine change. So um, I have some reflections uh, on what it's like uh, to be looking for that mirror. Um, and uh, I'll then go on to just talk briefly about some of the ways in which we have uh, held up a mirror to our communities uh, using the arts. Uh, so Audrey Law says, good mirrors are not cheap. It is a waste of time hating a mirror or its reflection instead of stopping the hand that makes glass with distortions. So I'd become used to apologizing for being, being there in all those spaces in which I worked. I started to hear it in my tone of voice. I'm sorry, but I became too accustomed to being the outlier, perhaps too comfortable in that position. I, like many others, spent many hours pointing out the same barely shifting disparities in life chances between people of different ethnic backgrounds. I was scarred by the iteration of predictable responses, uh, disbelief, accusations of bias and exaggeration, what aboutery, or simply shrugs of indifference. My vocal cords became conditioned towards emollients. Similarly, my language became constrained only to those configurations of phrasing that behavioral scientists had road tested. I'd learned what configuration of words helped others to listen, which examples sparks a flicker of empathy, how to avoid the bear traps of psychological discomfort 
the disabled action until eventually whispering apologetically in a kind of coded language uh, I start to accept the limitations imposed on my voice um, and on my identity I start to accept those limitations almost as the price of the ticket yes that was me the one whose visible presence changed the tone of the conversation but given the rarity with which that presence changed outcomes, I lived with a sneaking suspicion that being in the room simply enabled others to think that the issues of inequity had been dealt with. Undoubtedly, there were interventions that were addressing racial inequality and, and uh, sometimes I think I might have changed, may have changed some minds. However, the lack of real world impact um, meant that to keep motivated, it was best to stop focusing on outcomes settling for proxy measures or, or, or clinging to kind of small changes in attitudinal surveys. Um, so I was spending a huge amount of my time um, challenging racism uh, and that's a, a noble uh, thing to do, but it does have an impact uh, on people's lives. Um, So I got to a point in 2014 where I'd been addressing public policy on racial equity. Um, I, I was leading uh, work at a think tank. Um, and it came to a crunch point uh, due to the financial downturn. I was required to add a few more talented and committed black people to the unemployment figures. Um, exhausted and feeling defeated, uh, I moved on. And on passing, I published a letter to my Windrush parents, um, a kind of apology for my part in a decade of more testing to destruction, a change model that changed me, uh, but left racial inequalities largely intact or growing. Unlike uh, one of my interns at the time, I still talk to white people about race um, and I'm fascinated about the different perspectives on social, social phenomena. Um, but what has changed is that I understand better how, how socially constructed identities like race, ethnicity, and gender are both playgrounds that aid our shared expressions of humanity and battlegrounds for control and power. Um, I've abandoned the popular narrative that change is a result of heroic individual leadership. Uh, I have no desire or intention to travel alone. Rather, I accept the um, rather than accept all those pressures that had reduced my voice to a whisper and my identity to a formula, um, my focus has shifted towards movement building and towards fashioning the expensive kind of mirrors, those that enable reflection of a reality that can move us beyond the current constraints of racialized and gendered refraction, that automatically position a black man, a black gay man, as a problem to solve, rather than as an equal citizen and vital parts of our collective journey to better. Ralph Ellison writes, uh, I am an invisible man. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, see themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. So the movement that I'm now committed to be part of is one focused on the liberation of black, bi, gay, and trans men. Um, in Essex Temple's words, an organisation to save our lives. Blackout UK brings together bi, gay and trans men of African descent in the UK, and it mobilises them to build collective responses to the challenges that we face. Um, we started in 2016 as a web platform, seeking to amplify our voices uh, and just to marshal conversations between us about our lives, our dreams and our aspirations. Um, conversations for which we had no infrastructure, Despite at least 40 years of organizing, um, we were often hidden for reasons of safety and security and regularly ignored as a result. We described this early phase of our work as coming out of the quiet. Uh, we recognized we were not voiceless, rather we were just unheard, typical for Alison's Invisible Men. Um, so we began a conversation where we could define ourselves rather than to be defined by others. Um, and uh, 
And very quickly we began unearthing stories of young men lost for want of companionship, a friendly ear, or someone who understands what they're going through. Um, we became determined to intentionally build our futures together and to make space for us. Um, and one way in which we did that, uh, I just want to show this before we go uh, into the, the Q&A, um, is by uh, the takeover of National Portrait Gallery uh, for one evening in February, where we uh, were able, with, uh, with our key speaker, David McCalman, uh, to represent to an audience uh, black queer stories from a black queer perspective. Um, and that became a really important moment uh, for us in being intentional about building our futures together, seeing each other as an audience, um, but also uh, using um, a, a portrait from the National Portrait Gallery as a, as a starting point uh, for, a, for, a, for a discussion, um, which we hope uh, will continue uh, for, for a long period. I'll just show you that. People will always be awake and will always be alive. And they call that black, queer, magic, hashtag. An amazing lecture by David McCallman. I mean, it was a phenomenal performance. It was enjoyable as well as enlightening, uplifting. It's amazing just to see the diversity of the performance today. The music, the poetry. It's really good to support the community and also to come out, especially as artists, and also to be able to have that dialogue with people afterwards. To have an organisation such as Blackout UK that focuses purely on black queer men in the UK it feels amazing, it feels empowering, it makes us feel someone is out here representing us and cares about our issues. Being in a room full with black gay men is absolutely amazing. It makes me feel proud, at least for once I can get to see myself, I can get to hear stories that I relate to. For me, this event is exciting. Innovative. Progressive. Brilliant. Fierce and fabulous. Inspirational. Spectacular. Amazing. More, please. Now, I, I just wanted to also thank everybody for their presentations. Fantastic presentation from all presenters. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to go to the first question, which was Siobhan, which was about the uh, slideshow by by Daniel uh, Reagan, and um, and she asks, um, did the creative contributions of the men with lived experience feature in the exhibition, or did it influence the interpretation in any way? Now, I can't, because Daniel's not here, I can't fully answer this question, but my understanding is that the um, answer is yes to both of those questions, but the, 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 um, exhibition I think the date was the 21st of June that's um, for that exhibition so I guess you should go and see the show and then you can learn more about that so sorry I can't say more about that Siobhan but um, um, yeah it's a good question that you've asked so um, yeah I'm just gonna look for the uh, the the chat uh, for the questions to to come up um, and um, we can share them with the panel. Um, welcome back panel, thank you. Um, no more questions yet. Okay, um, right. So I just wondered, you've all shared really um, quite different uh, perspective on collections, different collections, but I can see some kind of um, cross fertilization there actually uh, between uh, what you were talking about Miranda and um, uh, um, Barbara, for example, with um, uh, as a, a more scientific uh, uh, collection, but also I think in terms of what Rob was talking about, in terms of inclusivity and engaging with a um, collection like the North National Portrait Gallery. So I'm just wondering, I'm going to put you, uh, give a, ask a question, which is, uh, um, do, do you, what commonalities did you see um, in each other's approach to using um, uh, collections and addressing well-being. Um, I'm just wondering if if you saw correspondences in your own work because I don't think you've all. Uh, there's only two of you that have probably worked together, but yeah. Um, 
any correspondences? Miranda, for example. Well, definitely cross over with myself and, and Barbara, and, and um, I did see the exhibition that you were talking about. Um, and, and, and because I used the, um, uh, the main part of my talk was a botanical example and medicinal properties. And so, yeah, it would link closely with the Welcome and, and their collections. Um, and, and essentially all the, all the stories that the narratives that we were, we're telling here today is all about inclusivity and, and where um, wh when you look at um, images, portraits in particular, um, as I said with my, my first um, illustration, there, there was a lot going on in there. And um, sometimes just by storytelling, that's how you can explain it all because you can't fit everything um, into an interpretation panel, but um, it's all about opening um, people's eyes and making them aware that there's, a, there's many layers to one image is what it's about. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah, I was oh, just going to yes, yes. <laughs> respond to, to Miranda, and I'm, I'm so happy yes. we are sharing the screen because I've also been following your your work and um, and yeah and this idea that uh, like like the image of the Ayurvedic man, no? that in one image you can look at all these different kind of colonial encounters and 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 how um, something from a collection can be so relevant these days. And I think I mean the next step where we're looking at natural history collections, so some of the medicinal plants that you are looking at or that I've been looking at with Ayurvedic man is, is how we open up this kind of intersectional um, approach beyond, I mean, as we are doing like with race and with gender and coloniality, but thinking about climate change, climate change as well, and like climate justice. And, and, and I, I'm really excited about the power of, of those collections to also open up to talk about the environment and, and what is happening um, now. I agree, Barbara. <laughs> Let's meet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Barbara. Um, I have got another question from Geraldine at Leeds Arts and Health and Wellbeing Network. And the question is, what take, what takeaways would you want your audience um, uh, to consider in their arts and health practice and enjoyment of arts and culture? So anybody who wants to respond to that. I'm happy to respond. I think uh, I'd encourage people to think about uh, inviting different voices to to appraise and interpret um, objects and collections. I think it really brings another dimension to collections um, and and yeah, and broadens our understanding. I was really interested in the way that um, Barbara's work brings in, you know, people to not just to to be part of the exhibition, but also to help curate the sort of the, the, the exhibition materials and the environment around the collection. I think it really brings another dimension and makes those kind of cultural spaces much more accessible as well as bringing different ideas in. Thanks, Victoria. In fact, um, the next question is addressed directly to you um, from uh, Hannah, who says, uh, thank you very much for your present fascinating paper. I'm really interested in how engaging with the arts impacts on individuals with dementia and from the images you showed many of the artworks undertaken were very multi-sensory engaging with much more than just sight to what extent do you think multi-sensory experience and engagement in producing these artworks is significant in helping those involved? Yeah, that's a really great question. And although my talk focused mainly on visual arts, I've also been working with other senses, um, such as taste, working with chefs in terms of food design um, and food aesthetics. And also I'm interested in sense of smell as well. And I think it's about providing a different, different ways of reaching and connecting and communicating with people living with dementia, um, which may be through a variety of different senses. Of course, artwork can do that, but I think working with diverse collections can bring other types of opportunities as well, because everybody with dementia is different. Everyone has different interests and different ways of communicating and different preferences. But in terms of the evidence, I mean, there, there's a growing um, body of evidence for the, uh, to show that art is, is beneficial for people in terms of their emotion and, and their communication. And yeah, there's, there's lots of reasons to use it. And um, 
it's great because lots of lots of people are coming and getting involved in this type of research now so it's a really interesting and and growing area of work thanks for the question thank you victoria the, the next question actually is about uh, decolonization i suppose is what we call it from um uh, Sarah, who asks, um, who says thanks for your papers, and um, Miranda and uh, Barbara, um, can you share any thoughts you might have on restitution related to natural history collections, such as compensation calculated from the pharmaceutical value of indigenous plants and knowledge? Um, hi, Sarah. Um, I it's it. I guess. I don't have like an answer, like it's a really, really complex kind of loaded question. But I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm just one thought and I'm also gonna type here the paper what I think is the answer to that question. Um, I mentioned before Sita already and he brought this paper saying uh, who owns traditional med medical knowledge. It's, it's not so straightforward as this kind of East West kind of dichotomy that we tend to think about. So like um, she writes about the curcuma turmeric and like who owns the, the, that, that kind of medicinal knowledge in the curcuma. And uh, I mean, I, I won't be able to do justice to, to her research. So, so you, should read, um, you should read this case study, but she's talking about a battle between um, the Indian government and, and uh, a pharmaceutical company in the States uh, for curcuma. And, and if the Indian government claims that that's that that is um, that they own um, the medicinal properties of, of curcuma. They are also perhaps the current government are perhaps disregarding um, the knowledge that came from other cultures that may not be Hindu or may not be um, male. So it's it's like it's really complex. Um, all kind of the different cultures that have been using kind of these plants. Um, so yeah, I'm not doing justice to 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 this text, but I think the answer is probably. Uh, there, I don't know, Miranda, you may have more of an insight that, than me on this. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I would definitely agree with you, it's complex. Um, I ask my question, well, it, it, myself questions every, every day when you're investigating the, the collections and, and, you know, when you're trying to reveal all, all, all these narratives and stories. As I said, there are many, many layers and um, it, that paper is definitely worth a, a read. But um, one thing I would say, it, it's, it's got to be continuous open discussions as well. Um, you know, we're talking about inclusivity and, and that's, you know, got to hear all sides, all, all, all voices um, in that sense. And, um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's taken a lot of time. Um, it's about con continuing, continuing that, that discussion. I, I don't have any simple answers. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I just try to enter into many discussions and give my insight, such as this one here, here now. And I would suggest reading the paper or for that person to also contact me as well um, for discussions on it. Yeah. Thanks, Miranda. There's so many interesting questions coming in yeah. and I'm not sure I that we have time can't, to- can't do it time as well, Justice. I mean, cause that last yeah. question is probably like a whole hour or even more. I know. <laughs> It is, it is. Um, there is a, a, so many fascinating questions now coming up. There, there's one about mixing uh, botanical, um, uh, you know, collections, different types of collections, oil paintings, botanical specimens, sculpture, geology. Um, is this a, a better way to, to, to convey intersectional issues? This is a question from Hannah. Um, uh, what do you think? Rob, what do you think about um, um, the potential of, I mean, you were talking about the National Portrait Gallery. Um, do you think that uh, mixing collections might be a better way to tell intersectional stories? Uh, definitely. I think if, if we can hold our audiences at the centre of the work, that feels like a, like a good uh, place to start. So uh, on that night in National Portrait Gallery, we had uh, DJs, uh, we had uh, a dance performance, we had uh, original music. Uh, as well as um, a lecture which was reflecting um, portraiture back to the uh, back to the audience. Um, we're, we're, we're complex people, so if we can uh, find ways of uh, of capturing people's imaginations, um, 
I think that's that's going to take uh, more than one uh, sense being uh, being excited. So, uh, if museums and galleries are able to connect, uh, that will feel feels more like a human response uh, rather than just a, a purely curatorial one. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Yeah. Now, th there's another question uh, from Helena, and. Um, it, she asks, in relation to museums and galleries, do the panel feel that more inclusive narratives are being exhibited and told generally? There are a lot of untold narratives and it's often it often seems that they are generated as a special project rather than as an integrated part of working on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's open to all of you really i think there's there's a couple of examples of institutions where there's really good practice um for example dulwich picture gallery has been really committed to this area of work of working inclusively you know for for, for decades and also the whitworth gallery um in manchester i was just thinking of a project there called beyond dementia where um people living with dementia co-curated an exhibition there and i think ongoing the idea is of I'm really interested in working co in with a co-design kind of process co-creatively alongside people what I do know is that no matter how free and welcome and open um, you know cultural institutions are there are still some people in the community who will not come in you know without a special invitation and we need to think about ways of working with people so that they feel that these spaces that they are welcome in these spaces there is something for them to get involved with and that involves parity and that involves you know dismantling some of the hierarchical structures which prevent people um, from feeling that they're able to come in thanks victoria um I'm going to jump to this question because it's about the pandemic um, and this is Kate thanking everybody for their presentations and um, she has particularly focused on Barbara's challenge to the idea of good health as a destination. Do you think the pandemic will accelerate a shift in the way we think about museums and collections and their potential to heal? Did you want to take that, Barbara? Oh, um, um, okay, am I? <laughs> it could be. It could be you. It could be uh, Victoria, or it could be yes. Um, well, I think for many there has been a pause, not to to to, to rethink um, our practice, and and in a way we've all been um, touched in many different levels by by the pandemic. Um, um, but I also think it's hard to know. People may want to engage in totally different ideas and topics for a while i don't know do we need do we need um you know I, I, it's it's really hard to know what our audiences are are going to want and like what i'm hoping is that the kind of museum practice will, will evolve kind of to center health inclusion and accessibility but in terms of the subject matters of the exhibitions who knows no what if people may want a break I don't know. Okay, well, thank you, Barbara, and, and thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have much time, but time has been called. Um, so um, I'm going to end it now, and I'm going to thank the panellists again, uh, Rob, Victoria, Barbara, and Miranda for their presentation. Thank you so much. It's been great working with you. Thank you to the National Gallery for hosting us all, and thanks to the audience for such wonderful questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time and so we're going to wind up now and we're going to end with that sound piece uncensored as i mentioned um that's been um uh, made by um adam smith the log books podcast of untold stories from britain's lgbtq plus history another way of engaging with a collection um the bishopsgate collection and i want to thank everybody for attending thanks to the national gallery for um hosting this very important subject and i hope that, that we can continue these conversations in different ways so thank you all very much and have a great evening <laughs> that was a big club it's still a big club a, a three thousand capacity venue and it was packed I, I was largely in the cellar, which on Thursdays was leather only at that point, but amazing number of waistcoats you could keep to slip onto mates who, who, who wanted to come in. We always, we always had 
a way of letting out our friends if we really wanted to. And they had all sorts of people on. Your Bronsky Beat, your Rhythmics, all sorts of bands. It was, they were new romantics, they were goths. But they all came together on the one night. It was London in the 80s at that point where it was you know, really fashionable and trendy and the gay scene was at the heart of it and heaven was, was, was you know, right there. This is a logbook entry from 11th of March 1990. Call around to say how he could become gay. 16 year old absolutely besotted by the lead singer in Erasure. Dresses like his idol, has his hairstyle the same, copies his mannerisms too. Lead singer is gay, so our 16 year old wants to be gay too. How? What's the secret? Any answers? You're listening to The Logbooks, stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history and conversations about being queer today. In partnership with Switchboard, the LGBT plus helpline. I'm Adam Smith. And I'm Tash Walker. This is a logbook entry from June 5th, 1988. 11.15am. Woman in East London wanting to know implications of Clause 28 on starting a new lesbian gay restaurant there. Encouraged. A later note adds, Julian's found some. Wonderful man. This is a logbook entry from May 14th, 1988. Woman call Orang wanting to know where she can buy a Stop the Claws t-shirt. If anyone knows, can they write it here? She will phone back in a few days to see if we found out. Answer. Well, you can order them from Spare Rib and the Pink Paper. You can buy them from Sister Right. So you tried to keep together in the marches, but there was strength pulled from that. There was strength pulled from each other. We had our banners, we had our huge labras, you know, we would, which was a double-headed axe. So we would carry this stuff and we would shout, scream, beat drums, sing. You know, it was a tremendous community thing. And that brought women much more together to realise that there weren't one or two of us. There were hundreds of us. And we weren't quiet. We weren't meek, we weren't kind, we were out there, we were fucking powerful and we were going to take our space. This is a logbook entry from June 1982. Help! A young Ghanaian male wants to live in this country. Under the terms of the Nationality Act, he may do this if he marries an EEC citizen who resides here, i.e. French, German, etc. If anyone can help with advice, please leave a note for me. Thanks, Peter. How? I don't know. The registrar didn't realise there was something amiss because the assembled crew was like something out of the bar scene, out of Star Wars. They were just extraordinary. People dressed in drag, feathers, ballroom gowns, and it was packed. There were people waiting in the corridor. This is a logbook entry from May 6th. 1984. The volunteer who took the call was Donna. I've just had to hoax calls from a bunch of 11 year olds. The first time they rang we had a very erudite conversation about Judy Garland. They then phoned back and serenaded me with a full version in tune of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Teeny Bob High Cam. Wonderful. You're listening to The Logbooks, stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history and conversations about being queer today. In partnership with Switchboard, the LGBT plus helpline. You can send us your feedback and stories to hello at thelogbooks.org or join the conversation on social media with the hashtag thelogbooks. (laughs) 